All right. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us online uh, for this iteration of our online lectures, Global Mind for Ukraine. If you join us for the first time, uh, my name is Timothy Brick, and I'm a rector at the Kiev School of Economics. We started this project um, almost immediately after the beginning of the invasion to raise awareness about Ukraine, but also to, to signal some solidarity for the academic community. And we really appreciate um, all the efforts of our speakers, uh, global intellectuals, scholars, and artists who visit us to uh, share their wisdom and um, uh, tell us what they know from their research. And today we have a, a yet another great guest, uh, Bart Benikovsky. He is Associate Professor of Sociology and Politics at uh, NYU, New York University. Uh, he has published widely in top journals in his field, American Sociological Review, Social Forces, many others. He has studied a lot of um, exciting things, but recently he has been focused on nationalism, electoral behavior, and populism. And I was privileged to meet uh, Bart in person in NYU uh, briefly when I was a visiting fellow, and I really enjoyed his lecture. And I'm very happy to see you, Bart, again, although virtually, and I'm excited and looking forward to, to your lecture. So thank you for being with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, Timothy, and to both you and Ludmila for the uh, invitation. It's, I've got to say it's an absolute honor to be with you today. Um, I'm in awe of everyone at Kiev um, um, School of Economics for just persisting through through the last um, you know um, few months uh, amidst really difficult and horrible circumstances. And so uh, it's really a testament to to your resilience and to the to your commitment to intellectual pursuit uh, to to continue against all odds. And so. Um, again, thank you so much for the, for the introduction. It's, it's a true privilege and pleasure. Um, so today I'll be speaking to you about uh, kind of a, a, a synthetic overview of my uh, research, empirical and theoretical research on the rise of radical right politics in Europe and the United States. Uh, many of the examples I'll give you are from, from my US-based research, but I'll, I sort of try to argue that uh, many of the arguments I'm making apply quite well to Western and Eastern Europe as well. Um, the talk won't be directly touching on, on issues relevant to, to the invasion and the war, but, but you'll probably so, see some implications, especially toward the end, in terms of uh, foreign policy and, uh, and, you know, and sort of the future of U.S. and international politics in, in the next few years. Um, but the real task here uh, uh, today is to try to think through and understand how to, how to explain the rise of radical right parties across a really wide range of cases, very different cases with very different circumstances on the ground, and yet quite similar outcomes in the sense of, of the mainstreaming of radical right parties, in some cases, new parties, in other cases, parties that have been um, captured by radical right actors. Uh, and so the, you know, the starting observation there is that this form of politics has been with us for the last you know, 30 years, uh, and in some cases longer, uh, but that cast of characters that it involves has been con continually growing. Um, and one could, of course, add to this um, Putin, who's been doing this for a long time, um, but also a number of new entrants, Maloney and others. And so the, you know, at, at various points in the last 20 years, people would write dissertations on the negative cases, the places where radical right politics hasn't taken off yet. And inevitably, a year or two later, uh, places like Sweden, like Finland would get their own um, um, uh, radical right party. And so the number of negative cases is really dwindling. Um, we can think of Canada, we can think of uh, maybe Ireland, to some degree Portugal, although not really anymore. Um, so, you know, clearly this form of politics is with us uh, and, it's, and it's spread quite widely uh, and, and most likely it's here to stay. And so um, the question is, how do we explain it? How do we explain the timing of it? How do we understand what this, what this form of politics involves? Um, and I want to suggest to you that, that the large literature on this topic that, that has really um, proliferated in the last, I guess, let's say seven years, um, has some limitations. The first of those is that a lot of the explanations for this form of politics have this binary opposition between economic factors and cultural factors. Uh, and cultural factors typically are uh, essentially uh, um, uh, a stand-in for uh, specific outgroup antipathies. And so there are many papers written, now, whether it's the economy or whether it's anti-immigration sentiment. Um, and I, I would argue that this dichotomy is really a, um, a false one in the sense that 
um, cult, you know, economic factors are, are filtered through cultural understandings and narratives. Uh, sometimes uh, cultural grievances can um, lead to the perception of economic um, uh, problems uh, and, their, and their reframing. So it's really not either or, it's really both. Um, and the, the, the problem here is also that there's kind of a, a central concept in this literature, called, you know, referred to a status thread, this idea that certain groups uh, feel threatened in terms of their place in the national hierarchy. Uh, and that's often, again, opposed with economic factors. And in fact, um, as I will argue today, status there is a really important mechanism that, um, that mediates between a whole slew of grievances, economics, demographic, cultural, and uh, radical right support. So again, this, this concept of status there is really useful, but it's rather ill-defined um, and, and unnecessarily opposed with economic factors in much of the literature. Um, there are also other conceptual problems. Uh, people often talk about populist parties. Without, uh, you know, and sort of in a, in, in a lay sense, uh, it's a reasonable uh, shorthand, but it leads to a conflation of, of distinct analytical elements in, in, in what the radical right is and why it's been surging. So uh, I will argue that we need to disentangle populism from nationalism and authoritarianism as key components of radical right politics. Um, in general, um, I, you know, my, my, my perception, my, the way I think about this is that people have been really um, emphasizing monocausal explanations within countries. So it's the economy, right? It's, it's the China trade shock that led to Trump. Or, you know, it's immigration, influx of immigration. Um, so the argument I will make is that really there isn't a single cause within countries. People are, um, are motivated to vote for the radical right from, for, you know, a slew of different grievances. And when we make, when we sort of take the, the explanation to a comparative level, uh, it's even more, uh, I think, fruitless to focus on singular monocausal explanations, right? So if the economy is what drives right right politics, well, that doesn't really work in Poland, where the economic crisis in, you know, in, um, in the late 20 aughts uh, was quite muted, actually, compared to other countries. Or if we're going to talk about immigration, certainly that's an important factor in Western Europe. Um, but in the U.S., immigration from Mexico has actually been declining uh, in Eastern European countries until recently. Immigration was, uh, was a, you know, not a particularly prevalent um, uh, phenomenon. And so, um, again, a single explanation won't give us um, an account of radical right um, um, mainstreaming across such a wide range of cases. Um, there are other issues. The fact that many of the, um, of the causal factors that have been cited are actually largely invariant over time. That is, there have been authoritarian people, quote unquote, people with authoritarian characteristics in each one of our, the countries uh, in question for a long time. Uh, and in fact, the, the proportion of, of people who sort of display these kind of tendencies hasn't increased. So how do we explain change that is the rise of radical politics with something that is relatively constant? That's a problem. And finally, there is this issue in comparative research where everybody's got their favorite sort of pet theory of what happened in any given country. Many of these hold value, but they don't really help us explain the wide range of cases that we're dealing with. So certainly the fact that President, you know, that the Barack Obama was elected to the presidency created a backlash that then helped bring Trump into power. That makes sense. And certainly the Smolensk plane crash in Poland um, was a big uh, opportunity for the radical right to, um, to make sort of nationalist based uh, appeals to the public. But again, these are idiosyncratic case specific factors. Um, which may contribute to the rise of radical right politics, but don't scale up to a cross-national comparative explanation. So we have to strike a balance in trying to understand this phenomenon between particularities of individual cases and patterns that, that, um, uh, that are relevant across those cases. And I want to argue that part of the reason why we have some of these shortcomings is that um, culture as a, as a way of understanding social realities or cultural explanations uh, haven't been uh, th sufficiently theorized uh, in this literature. And I'm going to try to um, suggest to you one particular way of thinking about how culture, how cultural processes um, mediate the, the relation between kind of structural grievances and radical right success. So um, I think what we need are precise categories and we need a theoretical model that applies across these varied cases. Um, and so I think we should be thinking clearly about differences between nationalism and specific outgroup antipathies. We need to be thinking about status threat that I already mentioned, not um, as a prime cause, but as a mediating mechanism between uh, other factors. And we should take greater care with populism. It's certainly part of the explanation, but it is not the, um, it doesn't exhaust the definition of what radical right politics um, is. Uh, we should also strive for multi-causal explanations, potentially with common mechanisms across very different countries. Um, and we need to pay attention to changes in context and structural uh, context so that 
that's how we can get past this problem of explaining change uh, with what seems like constants. And I'll get to this more. But if nationalist frames and populist frames and authoritarian frames have been part of politics for a long time, and if people have exhibited nationalist, authoritarian, and populist tendencies for a long time, how do we explain the fact that these pre-existing frames and pre-existing beliefs are resonating all of a sudden in new ways? And that's where attention to context becomes really important. Um, and finally, I would argue that we need to think about both the supply side of, pol of politics and the demand side of politics to understand this phenomenon. That is, what are the frames and that, that elites use to appeal to their uh, potential supporters? And what are the beliefs and, and narratives that, that make sense to individual voters, uh, to people on the ground, right? So kind of top-down and bottom-up perspectives need to be brought together. Um, so uh, that's kind of what the, what the uh, shortcomings and some of the things I would propose to you are. More concretely, the model, the cultural model I want to propose to you has these features. So first of all, I want to argue that radical right politics consist of these three elements. I've already alluded to them, populism, nationalism, especially exclusionary nationalism, but also a nationalism that views the nation in negative light, uh, that's often nostalgic and it's often chauvinistic, um, as well as authoritarianism. So these are the three elements, populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism. I want to argue that disagreements about what the nation means, within, disagreements within national populations about what the nation means um, are always with us, but they're typically latent. But once in a while, they become salient and become a potent uh, a source of political mobilization. And that's what's happened in a lot of the cases I'm describing of the rise of radical right politics. And then finally, that kind of aggregate trends, looking at overall population means is actually not where the interesting action is. Most countries um, in Europe, um, the US and, and the Anglosphere have been, have been getting more inclusive in terms of uh, popular attitudes. So in, in the aggregate, it seems like things are getting better. Uh, people are becoming more egalitarian. People should be turning away from radical right politics. But in fact, when you look under the surface of those aggregate attitudes, there's a lot of churning happening and redistribution of attitudes across parties, across other cleavages. Um, we also see other, uh, other phenomena underneath this kind of aggregate level that I'll get to later, like the erosion of, of old identities and the replacement with nationalist identities that are becoming more salient. So um, I'll tell you more about that. And finally, um, we need to think about the consequences, of course, of radical right politics for liberal democracy both the liberalism side of liberal democracy and the democratic side of liberal democracy. So how groups interact with one another, the way, to, the, the way in which the state uses the law against particular groups, that's the liberal side. And then of course the institutions that ensure fair elections and the, and the peaceful transfer of power um, and, the, and the counting of all votes, right? Um, democratic institutions, both are threatened in different ways um, by the rise of radical right politics. And if I have time, I'll get to that um, toward the end. So, um, Three major puzzles, right? What is the radical right? Why has it been surging now? And what are the consequences? And I'll start with the first one. So as I already mentioned to you, I really, the way I think about this is that the radical right is constituted by three elements. Populism, which you've heard a lot about. Um, we can think of this as a way of, of making political claims that's predicated on a moral binary between some sort of a corrupt elite and the virtuous people. And the idea is that the elites, um, whoever they might be, uh, have essentially usurped power, political power, um, and uh, no longer represent the people. And the only solution is to essentially eject the elites from from uh, from government, from from political power, and take over for the people to take over um, uh, access to those institutions. And so this is really a way of of making political claims. We've heard it from all of the characters that I showed you in an earlier slide. So that's one element. Um, the second element on which I want to focus a little more in a minute is nationalism, and by which I really mean these cleavages and how people understand the nation, disagreements within countries about what the nation means. Um, and the third element um, is authoritarianism. And here, I just, what I mean by that is just a disregard for democratic institutions and a willingness to take whatever, to take whatever measures necessary to remain in power. So that often means uh, you know, things you, you, you know very well about from, uh, from Putin's Russia, from Erdogan's Turkey, from Orban's Hungary, from Kaczynski's Poland and beyond, um, the subjugation of the media, of, uh, of universities, of civil society, um, of, you know, very importantly, subjugation of, of free and independent courts, um, and quite often eventually uh, basically creating sham elections. Uh, and one doesn't have to look, of course, at Russia, Turkey, Hungary, or Poland for that. The US is at the precipice of this already. January 6th, the, the attempted coup uh, on the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. was just a preview of what we're going to be dealing with for the coming years. And my, my 
you know, uh, assumption is that in 2024 it's going to get um, even worse. So the you know fundamental democratic institutions are um, are targeted by authoritarian tendencies of a lot of these these parties and leaders. So populism and authoritarianism, we're going to leave for a minute, but I want to focus a little more on nationalism because it's really central to the way I think about the rise of radical right politics. And so um, the, before I get to to kind of the, the um, definition of nationalism and, and kind of what its varieties are. I should also mention, though, that these three elements, populism, nationalism, authoritarianism, come together in a way um, um, quite often because, because they have some family resemblances. Uh, they have some, they kind of do things for one another. And so if populist claims are about being anti-elite and pro-people, quite often the people are kind of this residual category that's not defined. Well, that's where ethno-nationalism can come in and fill in that category. So when Trump says, you know, we need to drain the swamp and kick out the kick out the corrupt uh, Washington politicians and bring America back to the people. He often says the people in quite vague terms, but his ethno-nationalist supporters know exactly what he means. It typically means white, Christian, uh, native-born Americans. And so, you know, you, you see a sort of a, 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 a way in which nationalism and populism uh, configure together in, in powerful ways. And you can see similar um, kind of uh, family resemblances and, and, and mutual um, kind of... Um, complementarities between authoritarianism and the other uh, elements as well. So if you want to bring back the country to the people, how do you do it? Well, one way you do it is you basically run roughshod over existing institutions. Um, and that's okay because it's sort of a political project that's worth these costs to the supporters of radical right politicians. But let me talk a little bit more about nationalism in particular. So um, the way I think about it is really not as a just a singular ideology uh, about the nation and the state being congruent, sort of thinking about state building and nation building from Gellner and from uh, and from Anderson and others, but really I think of nationalism as a way in which people understand their nation, their national um, um, belonging, their national identity. Um, so when you think Ukraine, when you think Poland, when you think Netherlands, you know, when somebody, in, when a, a resident of those countries, especially particularly a citizen of those countries, thinks of their own nation, a certain ideas, sort of a configuration of ideas comes to mind. Those ideas have to do with who is a legitimate member, who is not, right? To what degree does race, religion, language um, uh, matter for whether somebody is a, a legitimate uh, uh, member of the nation or not? Um, so that's you know something that people have studied quite a bit, ethnic versus civic nationalism and so forth, um, basically boundaries, symbolic boundaries of nationhood. But that's not the only thing that, that um, matters for people's understandings of the nation. People also think about what's the relationship between the state and the nation, right? Um, you know, in the U.S. case, uh, there's a lot of anti-statism here. Is the state something to be afraid of, something to be skeptical of, something to uh, oppose, or is the state something to be celebrated? Um, what other aspects of national heritage, of politics, economic accomplishments should we be proud or not proud of? So this really boils down to domain-specific national pride. So that's another set of beliefs and ideas that, that um, matter for how people understand their nation. And finally, there are ideas about how the nation fits into the rest of the world. You know, in this case, I'm just showing you examples of how do Americans think about the American military as a humanitarian force of good for good or a policeman of the world. Um, and you can sort of think of this as chauvinism, right? Do we think that our country is the greatest country in the world and everyone else is inferior? Um, or do we think of ourselves as just a member of the international community um, like any other, right? And so um, the, this is this kind of complex of ideas uh, here at the bottom is often thought of as chauvinism. For some political psychologists, it's actually the entirety of nationalism can be subsumed under chauvinism. I would argue that it's just one component in how we think about what the nation means. And so if you take these images that I sort of showed you here as, um, as kind of um, symbolic representations of these different beliefs, these ideas cohere into kind of cognitive frameworks or cultural models. And so I've just put up two of them here, schematic, you know, kind of examples. So, you know, a person on the left um, might think that anybody can be an American regardless of race, religion, or language, that the state should be celebrated. America's sort of projection of power is humanitarian, as a humanitarian force for good. The person on the right may have much more restrictive um, exclusionary ideas of national belonging. You know, you have to be Christian to be American. You have to speak English to be American and so forth, right? And, and skepticism toward the state and a kind of a, a much more militaristic, chauvinistic potentially view of America's place in the world. So again, these are examples and I mentioned individuals, but of course these individuals belong to broader communities of thought. 
right? So it's not just individuals who hold these kind of um, uh, configurations of beliefs, but entire sections of a population hold these beliefs. Uh, and of course, these beliefs are, you know, these two belief systems I'm showing you here are quite contradictory, right? They're conflictual. Um, they, if these two people were to talk or these two communities were to come together to have a discussion, they would disagree fundamentally about what America means. And so um, in past work, uh, a variety of papers, I've tried to measure these nationalist uh, beliefs using survey data, as well as text, uh, using computational text analysis on the, on the kind of um, uh, political claims making elite side. Um, and what I've observed repeatedly is that there is this tremendous within country heterogeneity in nationalist beliefs, but it's not just kind of a continuous mess of ideas. Really, these beliefs cohere into four robust schemas, right? Four kind of systems of thought. Um, and I, I, in the past, I've I labeled them liberal or creedal, restrictive, ardent, and disengaged. I'll tell you a little more about their composition in a minute. Um, but the key takeaway here is that these are pattern stable um, cultural belief systems. Um, they're correlated with demographic attributes, they're correlated with policy preferences, they're rooted in everyday experience, that is people have others around them who feel similarly, um, this is kind of reproduced generationally potentially, um, and I think of them as really constituting these, these cleavages in national populations. Now, the cleavages are latent quite often in the sense that people hold these, hold these beliefs, but they're not the main set of ideas through which they behave or through which they choose political candidates or around which they you know, argue around the dinner table. But once in a while, in certain historical circumstances, these latent cleavages can become manifest and politically mobilizable. And I wanna argue that in all the cases of countries that, um, that have had a rise of radical right politics in the last few couple of decades, um, these nationalist cleavages have come to be um, have come to be salient, have come to resonate more than they had in, uh, in the prior years. So what are these four types of nationalism? In a nutshell, I'm presenting them here without um, going into much depth of, about how I measure them. I just want to give you a sense of what they are so you can think with them as we get further into the, into the theoretical model. Um, so a creedal or liberal nationalist, creedal in the U.S., when I sort of scale this up beyond the U.S., I, I, I describe it as liberal nationalism restrictive nationalism, ardent nationalism, and disengaged or disengagement from the nation. So in a nutshell, these involve those kinds of beliefs I showed you in those pictures, right? How strongly you attach, you're attached to the, to the nation, what are the legitimate criteria of belonging, how proud are you in particular aspects of the nation and the state, and how chauvinist are you vis-a-vis -vis other countries, right? Same kinds of ideas that, that were in those images. Um, and the main takeaway here is that these four types of nationalism that you see arranged in the rows are not just a continuum from least nationalist to most nationalist. They're actually cross-cutting um, uh, configurations of ideas, right? That are not just monotonically arranged. So creedal nationalists or liberal nationalists are people who have moderate levels of, moderate levels of attachment to the nation. They're quite inclusive in how they define national boundaries. They have high levels of pride in the nation actually, but relatively moderate chauvinism. So these are kind of like, you know, in the US case, kind of center, uh, cent centrist liberal nationalists, right? People who love their country, you can think of them as patriotic, but are quite open-minded in terms of national belonging uh, and don't think of themselves as superior necessarily to other countries. Restrictive nationalists have high degrees of national attachment, ethno-religious, ethno-cultural boundaries of the nation. Um, interestingly, low levels of pride. So when you think back to a lot of radical right discourse that says the nation is going downhill, this is not our nation things are really bad and we need to elect me to restore our national glory, this is what the, 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 these politicians are plugging into. Uh, low levels of pride in the nation as it exists today and especially in the state institutions um, and moderate levels of chauvinism. Ardent nationalists are high across the board, right? So these are people who are essentially, you know, in some ways these are kind of classic uh, ex exclusionary kind of jingoistic nationalists, right? High levels of attachment, exclusionary boundaries, high levels of pride, high levels of chauvinism. Um, so, you know, Americans may not know this, but many people around the world, when they think of American nationalism, they think of this, right? Like chauvinistic, exclusionary, um, um, kind of religious uh, conservative nationalists. And finally, the last one is sort of low across the board. And it's just quite interesting. These are people who have kind of an arm's length relationship to the nation. They don't really care who's a member. Anybody can be a member of the nation. They're not deeply attached to the nation. They also have low levels of pride um, and low levels of chauvinism. They just sort of, nation, nationalism in the nation is not a salient category for them. Um, they still 
you know, are oriented to the nation one way or another, but they're sort of they're sort of arm's length away from it. Um, and these people matter actually because this way of sort of distancing yourself from the nation has implications for political beliefs, beliefs as well and political behavior. Again, I want to call your attention to the fact that these are cross-cutting types. It's not just from low to high nationalism. There's some things that creedals and disengaged have in common, civic boundaries. There are other things that restrictives and disengaged have in common, low pride, right? So these are complicated configurations, but we can reduce them to these four types. And I, I mentioned I've seen these sort of repeatedly over and over, the kind of quite robust in US data, but I also see variants of them across all countries where I've looked at survey data, across Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and beyond. In slight with slight modifications, but the overall patterns are quite consistent. Okay, so we've talked about what the radical right is: populism, this, these kind of nationalist cleavages, and authoritarianism. Um, I've suggested that this is something that exists both in people's beliefs and is evoked in elite claims. So, how do we think about why this form of politics, this radical right, populist, nationalist, authoritarian politics, have been surging? In the recent past, you know, we can it depends. You know, can, you can date it differently. Obviously, the roots of this stuff in the seventies and eighties, but taking off in the nineties and really speeding up in the two thousands. So, why has it been surging? If I were to just give you one sentence, here's what I would say. Um, my view is that these nationalist cleavages I've, I've, I've described to you are essentially the fuel behind the rise of radical right politics. That when they're mobilized, they are the thing that drives people to support people like Trump people like Kaczynski, people like Orban and so forth, or to support Brexit. Um, Anti-elitism and low levels of institutional trust, which are kind of the, the beliefs that are evoked by populist claims, stoke the fire, right? They kind of exacerbate these existing, uh, uh, the existing causal power of these nationalist cleavages. And what results is essentially tolerance for authoritarian rule, for rule that, um, that does not pay much attention to democratic, liberal democratic norms and institutions. That's sort of the model in a nutshell. I'll get into more detail in a minute. Um, but one thing to, again, uh, I already mentioned this briefly, but one thing to keep in mind is that what really matters here is how these exist pre-existing nationalist, populist, and authoritarian frames and these pre-existing nationalist, populist, and authoritarian beliefs resonate in new ways, right? I, I've mentioned these have been around for a while. I mean, you can really go back to the, you know, way back in history, certainly early 20th century. Um, but even in the last you know, 50, 60 years, in most democracies, we've seen these kinds of claims made and we've seen these beliefs in survey data and polls and elsewhere. But what makes these old frames and old beliefs resonate in new ways is in large part change in context. And especially perceptions among national majorities, ethno-racial, ethno-cultural majorities of their status being threatened by rapid social cultural changes. So let me dig into this a little more. Um, and give you a sense of, of sort of the, the theoretical model. Um, so the first question is like, you know, okay, so I mentioned that there are a bunch of changes that are making these old frames and beliefs resonate in new ways. What changes should we look to? Um, and I want to suggest again, against this kind of monocausal idea, but rather thinking about multiple prime causes, both within countries and even more so across countries. Some of these changes, of course, are economic, right? So um, economic crises. Uh, are an important uh, uh, aspect of, of the grievances that fuel this form of politics. The industrialization, capital mobility, trade shocks, all of the things that economists have written about quite a, quite a bit matter. But also demographic changes. So immigration, refugee flows, particularly certain kinds of refugees over others, um, all of these things also create a sense of threat, whether they're real or not. I'll come back to this. In some cases, there is no increase in immigration or there wasn't at the time of radical right success, but there's a phantom fear that it's coming. Um, national security threats. Um, in, the, you know, in the US, 9-11 was really important. It, it's important spans beyond the US borders, but generally a sense of threat from terrorism, from foreign aggression is part of the equation as well. In the US, issues around equity, social justice, and fairness are also part of this complex of grievances, right? The idea that some people are unfairly getting ahead of me in line, right? And often some people have very clear racial, ethnic, and cultural properties. As well as cultural change in mainstream culture, right? And popular culture. In the US case here, again, these are examples from the US, but you can imagine this elsewhere. Who gets valorized in popular culture? 
Midwestern white Americans? Or is the landscape of popular culture changing, becoming more, more multicultural and cosmopolitan? Now, I'm not suggesting that Hollywood is somehow equitable and all of a sudden non-whites are getting you know, more than their fair share of, of income. That's not at all the case. It's still a highly unequal white dominated field. But nonetheless, just the kind of what people see in the media um, has changed over time. And it's kind of con contributed to the sense that things are changing culturally. And you can think of also changing linguistic norms, right? What What is legitimate form of talk and what isn't? What some people call political correctness in a pretty politicized way. Um, finally, social movements. So obviously Black Lives Matter in the US matters, but um, there are other social movements elsewhere that are uh, also contributing to a, sense of, to a sense of rapid change in the US. Sort of in some ways, the Obama election crystallized a lot of this and the whole birther movement, which tried to delegitimize Obama as a non-American, um, was part of the kind of expression of a lot of these grievances. So the point here is that you have this a, a set of different kinds of, um, of structural changes. And again, these will differ across countries, not just within countries. In some countries, the economic stuff will be more important. In some countries, the immigration stuff will be more important. Um, but they plug into an existing set of nationalist, populist, and authoritarian beliefs and ideas sort of, and, and frames. So here's where I'm going to sketch out this, this model in, in finally in some detail. So at the top here, you've got supply side politics. What are politicians saying? What frames are they using in campaigns to mobilize support? On the bottom side, you've got beliefs and attitudes. Um, in each case, you've got nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism, as I've suggested, in terms of beliefs and frames. For most part, these things just chug along. Again, these, things, these frames and beliefs have been around for a while. At the aggregate level, not much is happening. If anything, people are becoming more inclusive, and et cetera. But as I already alluded, if you dig a little deeper, there are things happening. Old identities like labor movement identities, union identities are eroding. Um, beliefs are sorting across parties in the US in particular, but also in Europe in, in slightly different ways. Um, that's on the, on the demand side. On the supply side, politicians are experimenting with these frames and maybe recombining them in new ways. I'll show you some empirical results to back this up in a minute. So there is stuff happening underneath, right? I'm underneath the aggregate level. But then you have these contextual changes, these, these sort of sources of change that I mentioned uh, earlier, cultural, demographic, economic, um, you know, security, and so forth. I want to argue that these different sources of threat kind of create anxiety in ethno-racial majorities, ethnocultural majorities, religious majorities um, that are kind of in Kuwait, right? Like people know stuff is happening, stuff is changing, it's making them feel insecure, but they don't really have an overall theory of what's happening and why it's happening. And here I would argue is where elites come in, opportunistic elites come in, Politi politicians, media personalities, um, and various movements that basically take these inchoate fears and anxieties, bundle them together into a sense of overall status threat. They say, you're scared of migration. You're scared of your, you know, your kids not doing as well economically as you. You're scared of the culture of this country changing. Well, guess what? All of this stuff is part and parcel of, of, of a bigger change that you should be really terrified of. Um, and then they point the finger at whose fault it is, right? Um, and they point a finger typically toward elites and or, toward minorities. And what that essentially does, effectively does, is it turns those inchoate fears and anxieties into powerful outgroup resentments, and it heightens a sense of collective status threat among these majorities that are have taken for granted their dominant role in society for many, many years, right, for decades, centuries. That status threat, once activated, then makes those nationalist cleavages I talked to you about earlier change from being latent to being powerfully manifest and mobilizable. So once these ethnocultural, ethno-religious, ethno-racial majorities feel like they're about to lose their place in society for all of the different reasons, they all of a sudden, all of a sudden say this country must be saved against the elites and against those minorities. Those minorities can be you know, domestic racial minorities, they can be immigra immigrants, they can be uh, religious minorities. Once that happens, when these, uh, once these nationalist cleavages are activated, support for radical right parties grows. In some cases, that means they gain, you know, they get 10% of the vote. In other cases, it means they take over an entire party and, and rise to, get to power, essentially. Uh, all of that, how this plays out, depends on institutional differences between countries. But I think what's really important to keep in mind here is that once this process succeeds, the whole thing diffuses across countries. That is, people learn from one another how to make the claims, how to scare people in terms of kind of bundling those fears and turning them into resentments, how to activate those nationalist cleavages, how to 
succeed electorally. And then finally, once in office, once in power, how to put in practice those authoritarian tendencies. And so you have people like Kaczynski mimicking Orban, even though they disagree fundamentally, especially on Russia, right? Um, but they're mimicking one, you know, Kaczynski is basically mimicking Orban's authoritarian steps, take over the courts, take over the media, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you can see diffusion from Putin, Erdogan to Orban to Kaczynski, maybe even Trump and so forth. So the model of mobilization diffuses and the model of governance diffuses. Kim, Kim Lane Shepley has written quite a bit on this authoritarian toolkit in a persuasive manner. Um, so I, I, you know, given time constraints, I'm not going to get into a ton of detail in terms of empirical evidence, but I'll just mention that I've done empirical work on most parts of this model, and I'm you know, writing up the whole thing in, in book form. Um, but just to give you a few little details. So first, starting with the mobilization of national cleavages here on the right, um, I've done work showing in the US that, you know, which type of nationalist configuration you adhere to shapes your voting attitudes and voting preferences. So we, we did research um, um, prior to the 2016 election, and it turns out that, you know, whether you were creedal or restrictive or, 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 or disengaged mattered for whether you chose, uh, you preferred um, Trump over Clinton or vice versa. It also mattered for whether you voted for Clinton or Sanders actually in the primary or whether you voted for Trump or the moderate Republicans in the Republican primary. So there, and this is controlling for a whole slew of things, right? So these nationalist cleavages seem to matter. Um, in the European context, we've done something similar where um, it turns out that what nationalist beliefs you hold, controlling for a slew of other things, uh, is associated significantly whether, whether, with whether you support right, radical right parties or radical left parties across a whole wide range of European countries with some differences between Southern Eastern Europe and Northern Western Europe, but the trends are in similar, similar direction. So that's kind of the fact, just, just showing that in, the empirical evidence suggests that these cleavages can be mobilized and when they are mobilized, they're associated with voting patterns uh, in a pretty consistent manner across very different countries. Um, in terms of, um, so let me go back here for a second, in terms of the, the bottom kind of demand side, we've shown in the US that, um, these are again, these four nationalist types and on the Y axis, you've got probability of, of being Republican. So what essentially this shows you is that two of these nationalist cleavages over time in the US have become increasingly associated with party identification. So that to be democratic now means to adhere to creedal nationalism for most part. To be Republican means to adhere to restrictive nationalism for most part. Remember, this is like an exclusionary low pride Trumpist nationalism. Um, so that essentially suggests that the Republicans and Democrats no longer agree about what America means. Back in the 90s, these were cross-cutting cleavages. You couldn't predict national uh, beliefs, nationalist beliefs based on party ID and vice versa. By mid-2000s, there's a strong association. Note that this precedes Trump by many years, right? The demand for Trump-like politics was there long before, which is why we got the Tea Party in the US, which is why we had Sarah Palin as a candidate. This has been in the works for a long time. Trump just kind of keyed into it in a really powerful way and built on that longstanding demand. And in, the, in European countries, this plays out differently because it's not a two-party system, obviously. Um, but there are there is sorting and polarization across um, radical versus mainstream parties, new versus old parties, and so forth um, that we can talk about. Although that research is still in its early stages. Um, on the supply side, in terms of what politicians say, We've done work with computational text analysis showing that these frames, so this, these are again, populism, exclusion and nationalism and authoritarianism. And the next slide, I'll show you the other aspects of, of nationalist beliefs. These, Trump didn't, didn't invent these things. They've been around in American politics for the entire post-war period, right? So we're looking here at, at uh, campaign speeches from 1952 onward. There is one that you'll see in the middle here that Trump used more than anyone else. And in fact, it was quite non-existent prior to him, and that's explicit exclusionary nationalism. Now, does that mean that American presidential candidates before were always egalitarian? No, they used coded language um, for exclusion in the form of, the, of, of authoritarianism, that bottom row. Uh, and also, as we show in the paper, by, ref, by refraining from making inclusive claims when Democratic candidates did make inclusive claims. So it was more coded. By the time Trump came around, he said the quiet part out loud. Um, but, um, you know, uh, low pride have, has been around for a long time. Populism has been around for a long time. What we show in this paper is where Trump innovated was not just in making exclusionary claims more explicit, but recombining these frames and bringing them all together in ways that hadn't been done before. And in another paper, we show that nostalgia was actually the glue 
that made nationalism, populism, authoritarianism, you know, work well for Trump in ways that it had been only kind of partially um, uh, mobilized by other candidates. Finally, another paper uh, shows that not only do politicians use these frames, but they've essentially fused them in the minds of, of, um, of, of, of um, voters. So this experimental research shows that if you expose people to just populist claims, just anti-elite claims with no nationalist content, Republicans and Trump supporters will, will exhibit stronger antipathies towards minorities. So populism has become a dog whistle for essentially for ethno-nationalism. You say the elites are corrupt, the consequence is people dislike Latinos and African-Americans more. So these two frames, again, distinct frames have been fused together in powerful ways. And the final piece I'll show you is in terms of these structural shocks uh, and status threat. I've got a paper uh, with some colleagues about automation and fears of automation in the workplace. And it turns out that if you think your job will be taken by, you know, taken over by AI and robots, you're no more likely to support the radical right. You're actually more likely to support the radical left, if anything. But if you think that automation will change the kind of economic landscape for people like you, for your group, that's the bottom left here, that results in greater support for the radical right. So this is a sociotropic kind of concern with your group, not just with your own well-being. Okay, so that's the model. What, what are the consequences? I've got about 30 seconds to tell you what the consequences are, but you can imagine they're not pretty. Um, I mean, what all of this suggests is that liberal democracy is likely to be in peril. In peril, and I've had these there, some version of the slides for many years, and I keep making you know changing them from hypotheticals to actual reality. Um, so there is a crisis of liberal democracy. We know that it's coming. We know that in some places it's already well underway. Um, how it plays out depends on institutions that vary, but it's it's not looking too good. There's sort of two dangers. One is transition to competitive authoritarianism, what seems like democracy but is not at all democracy on, on in reality. Uh, and the other threat is geopolitical instability. And I used to say this as a hypothetical, but it's no longer, as you well know, better than anyone, hypothetical. Um, and so, you know, from threats to judicial autonomy, media independence, all the things we talked about, uh, constitutional continuity, um, the peaceful transition of power, these are all things that are now at risk in, in established advanced democracies. And people like to point to Eastern Europe and say, oh, these are new democracies. They don't have strong democratic values, you know, kind of these essentialist cultural arguments. What about the US, right? Where, which is sort of the epitome of democratic values. Well, this is the country that's at great risk of backsliding in the very near future and in some ways already has. Um, all of this is fueled by polarization, the erosion of norms and delegitimization of existing institutions by these parties and candidates. Um, the danger signs in the US are plenty and you've seen many of them from the decline in mutual toleration between the parties and you know, kind of pulling back from procedural forbearance threats to prosecute your opponents, firing of, of uh, people investigating the president, um, blocking of Supreme Court nominees, stacking of courts, things that, by the way, resemble Hungary and Poland in many ways. Um, of course, January 6th, the attempted coup is the kind of a, you know pinnacle of this, but also attacks on journalists, fake news, all of that stuff, the legitimization of civil society and protest. Um, the border wall, travel bans, and other ways of, of using existing laws in their to their letter but not their spirit right against um, minorities uh, a discriminatory form of legalism the problem in the us and in many of these countries is that this is endorsed wholesale by one of the two parties i mean the republicans are basically fully in support of this stuff there are a few individuals who maybe try to resist but this is trump's party and this is the party of people like ron DeSantis and others and so when the right, when what used to be the center right no longer opposes the democratic backsliding as Daniel Ziblatt has shown, the pathway to democratic erosion is pretty rapid. Um, and I should also say, aside from the democratic erosion, there's also just what kind of the, the stoking of, of ethno-nationalist fervor does to intergroup relations. So during COVID, you know, cases of anti-Asian violence in the US and urban centers proliferated. Uh, after Trump's election, violence against African-Americans and Muslims increased. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of dynamics that occur on the ground that are not just about institutions, but are essentially about person to person violence and intergroup relations. Um, so um, whether liberal democracy survives depends on the institutions. It also depends on what the center right does. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing is that the center right is looking more and more like the radical right across many countries. So um, I won't say what where we're headed. I can come back to this if you're interested in the Q and A. Um, but the final question is, in the last slide, is does the theoretical model travel? And I want to argue that, again, 
the cases are very different, right? So a lot of the examples were from the US. If you think about um, the UK and Brexit, you know, very different reality. This was Brexit was fueled by anti-Polish sentiment, anti-Eastern European sentiment, in some cases anti-Ukrainian sentiment back in the day, right? Um, and so it was about intra-EU migration. Eventually kind of shifted a little bit into Islamophobia, but but this, the foundation was this. Then you got Western European countries where Islamophobia is the main um, kind of driving force behind a lot of this. But then you've got Poland where, you know, uh, grievances around quote unquote gender ideology and about Islam essentially Islamophobia without Muslims and anti-Semitism without Jews is the reality in many Eastern European countries. So the point is that the grievances are very different from place to place. The starting conditions are very different. The kind of driving changes in, in, in society and, and social structure and economic structure are very different across cases. But I hope what I've shown you might give you kind of a, uh, might convince you that the mechanisms through which these varied grievances translate into radical right support are quite similar across cases. And the consequences of radical right, um, uh, the radical right gaining power are also quite similar across cases. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much um, you. for your very inspiring, very uh, coherent lecture. Also, you mentioned something about the book that you're working on the book. So, well, you know, I, I must use, um, take advantage of this conversation. So, you know, whenever you have your book published, you're welcome to present it uh, at Key School of Economics, hopefully in person. Um, I think it's a good time to open uh, this forum for questions and answers. I have my own, but I would prefer uh, our students and viewers to kick off with some of their questions. Um, if you guys need some time, you know, to digest or to prepare a question, of course, I can I can start. But um, just letting you know that you're welcome to to raise your hand or to write something in the Q and A session. Okay, so I will just you know start with my own questions to to give some um, space to, to our students. Uh, yeah, you. I mean, I was really impressed. Uh, you have such a very detailed and coherent model, and you know. It seems like you, um, you know, you, you covered everything. So it's very difficult to, to ask a question because it was about everything and everything comes uh, together. I was just wondering about, you know, some, mm, some things related to, to the mechanisms which you showed. I know that there is in parallel, there is another mm, fast growing literature that speaks very much to the same mechanism, but using slightly different language, using more language of social psychology, you, you know, you're talking about status and how people perceive these narratives and how they feel threats. And uh, in social psychology, it's often described with this um, uh, term of um, identity, yeah? So how people right. mobilize around the identity and the process of identification is very important. I kind of missed a bit of this in your presentation. Is this on purpose or you also explore these uh, ideas in your models? That's a great question. Thank you, Timothy. And uh, and everyone else, I'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, any question, no, you know, no questions are off bounds. Um, but this is a really good question. I would say that for me, identity is quite central to the model. Um, that's sort of where where nationalism fits in for me. It's, it's one collective identity among many. So we all, you know, from social psychology, we all have multiple identities. We have kind of an identity hierarchy as, uh, you know, gender identities, uh, family role identities, professional identities, and various collective identities, whether they're religious or ethnic or racial or national. And so I think the, the real question, and this is where social psychology is really helpful, is, is it the case that in terms of political behavior, national identity has gone up in a hierarchy um, and you know particularly when it comes to to voting uh, and if so why and and that's sort of my argument is that that I think you know if you, certainly in, in in Western Europe and um, and in the United States in the 70s 60s 70s 80s people quite often voted on their economic identities that were um, that gave them a sense of self-worth. So thinking about you know social democratic parties, which have obviously collapsed across of, across much Europe, much of Europe, or in the U.S. Um, uh, being members of, of labor unions, uh, and then those votes were delivered, you know, kind of in a block form to the Democratic Party by unions. Um, why? Why did that work so well for so so many years? I think part of part of the explanation is that the social democratic parties um, and, and the unions in the US and in, in, in Europe as well gave people a sense of, of, of self-worth, right? Um, maybe things weren't always great. Maybe you were you know, living paycheck to paycheck. 
but you had dignity, you had worth by being a member of this broader community, by having common cause, by fighting for greater equality, wage increases, et cetera, right? Um, and what's, you know, so this is one argument about identities. When unions started collapsing in the U.S. pretty rapidly from the early 80s onward, which was a deliberate strategy, by the way, by the Republican Party from Reagan on, um, union membership declined. The, the kind of block voting of these folks for the Democrats uh, also declined. Many of these people moved to the Republican Party. But in terms of identity, their kind of self-worth that came from, from, from this labor identity now had to come from somewhere else. And I argue, and you know, again, for, for this, I have only partial evidence, but it, but it seems to be plausible that in the kind of identity vacuum that was left, kind of your conception as an American, a particular kind of American, the real American uh, filled in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the model is essentially as labor identity declines in your hierarchy of, of identities, your national identity increases. And of course, politicians try to evoke that, try to mobilize it, try to amplify it. And then, you know, what you get is people essentially voting on this kind of uh, grievance-based national identity more than on other forms of identity. And I think the last thing I'll say about this is I think it raises the question of like, what is to be done, right? Uh, does this mean that across European countries, the center left should be making their own nationalist appeals? Um, should the Democrats in the US make their own nationalist appeals? What does the left do to resist this march towards the radical right? And I think it's a tough question to answer. I mean, I think one thing for sure, Sherry Berman and others have argued, Anna Jamal Abusa, that the center left has essentially abandoned um, their original voters, right? Like their core in the 90s with third way politics. And so what we need is a meaningful vision, economic vision, policy vision from the left. I think that's right. Um, and it seems to not be forthcoming anywhere so far, but, but we need it. Uh, and then there's this tough question is, do you play the rights game among, on nationalist grounds? Do you try to argue against them, offer a different nationalist vision? Maybe, although it's risky, because then you're ceding the territory and you know, you're know you making nationalism salient, you're arguing over it. What we really need to do is change the topic of the conversation somehow, which is hard, right? So people don't vote based on their exclusion of nationalist beliefs, but they vote based on, I don't know, economic interest or some other policy preferences. Um, but that's hard. <laughs> so. It's a it's an open question how that plays out. Yeah, and um, yeah, I'll ask a couple more questions, and then um, yeah, I'll check. Maybe some of the students will ask uh, their questions as well. So um, yeah, another question I, I had in my mind, and it's um, um, again, it, it's um, I guess all my questions that I have, they're slightly uh, they are all united by the same theme that I want to step out a bit from your presentation because your presentation covered so much so originally naturally I want to ask like like let's talk about something else yeah sure. let's build a bridge between what you presented and what, what we know in some you know other um other parts of social science so um I was intrigued when you said something you know about this um uh, phenomena uh, globally that whatever country you pick, depending on the context and historical period, you can always find some types of grievances. Sometimes it's anti-Islamic movements or mm -hmm. anti-immigration or anti-automatization. So, you know, people find something to be against uh, uh, it. Like, like you said that, you know, uh, grievances are different. So I wonder whether you actually tap into some sort of a fundamental uh, part of our human nature, you know, that there is just some, we always find something to be against. Yeah. So ultimately maybe your, what you're actually talking is not, it's something more fundamental than nationalism. Yeah. Maybe you're talking about some, something even bigger than nationalism. Yeah. And perhaps this can connect your finding with people who study conspiracy theories, you know, and why people understand or don't understand COVID and vaccinations and things like that. So, so uh, I feel that, you know, you focus on nationalism, but there is some bigger uh, story behind it. So can you reflect on that and what you, what you sure. think of bigger picture? No, that's, that's great. I mean, I think you're absolutely right uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that uh, there is, you know, again, coming back to social psychology, maybe even evolutionary psychology, there's clear evidence that that humans are pretty quick to build in-group identities and out-group identities, you know, small group experiments have shown this. Um, and uh, you can always find some grievance and point a finger at someone else. 
Um, and in some ways, this kind of comes back to this uh, observation from in Ziblatt, Levitsky and Ziblatt's book and other work that there's always some surplus of, uh, not surplus, but like a, a, kind of a, 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 an availability of, of, a, of a group of authoritarians or nationalists in society. You know, they estimate around 30, 35% in the US history. That's always there. It's sort of a reservoir of potential support. Um, and, uh, and so I think the question becomes, when does that reservoir uh, when is it activated? Like why, if that's always the case, if humans have this tendency and if, you know, for some uh, parts of the population, that tendency is very important and particularly oriented towards, you know, racial others and ethnic others and religious others, why is it, why is it working now and not before? And I think this is where we need some context, um, contextual sort of explanations. So I think that's one thing. So there is kind of, there are various human tendencies that may be stable, but of course we need to, explain something that's changing. So, you know, there has to be some variation somewhere. Um, I think the other thing is in terms of why national versus something else. Um, so I think I would argue there that it's when these kind of maybe innate tendencies to other and exclude become filtered through the kind of national lens that they become really politically powerful, right? Like what gets politicized? Well, what gets politicized is where is the country now? Where, ought it, where should it go? Where things better in the past, right? And so, once you map these kind of maybe you know general tendencies onto things, feelings, and sentiments about the nation, which is what often politics revolves around, those things become politicized and politically mobilizable. And so, you know, much like with COVID, you were mentioning this kind of you know vaccine skepticism, which you know we saw in many countries in the U.S. It was really off the charts. Very quickly, it becomes politicized. And so, you know, coming back to your question about identity. Party identity, partisan identity in the U.S., which is really powerful, all of a sudden starts having all kinds of implications. So to be Republican means to be ethno-nationalist. To be Republican means to be skeptical of, of the state. To be Republican means to oppose the vaccine, right? This is not all sort of predetermined, but it get, it, there, it's sort of as a result of a, of a conscious process of pol politicization of these identities and these maybe general innate tendencies. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and again, as you pointed out, we see this in so many different places. So I talked about Eastern and Western Europe. I talked about the United States, but we can go to, you know, Modi's India, right? Where there the axis of differentiation is between Hindus and Muslims. So it's a Hindu nationalism that excludes Muslims. We can think about um, Brazil. We can think about the Philippines where this form of politics has increased uh, in recent years. And so the patterns are similar in terms of mechanisms, but quite different in terms of the actual content. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a good question, uh, and it's really a question of salience and resonance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is actually one question uh, by the student. Oh, great. Um, yeah, and, um, well, you know, it's a long question, so I'll try to phrase it in a bit sure. of a way. Uh, so, on the one hand, Ukraine and Ukrainians now, you know, they're fighting the war, they're opposed to another country which is authoritarian, and according to many surveys, what we know that Ukrainians actually, at least in their answers, they value democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we say in polling even now. At the same time, the student is concerned that maybe, you know, after the war ends or even now, it's not clear whether Ukrainians will fa favor radical right-wing parties or not. So do you think that, mm -hmm. like, if there is a scenario in which Ukraine will favor uh, right-wing parties after the end of the war. So what kind of mechanism can, you know, sort right. of lead Ukraine into this path? Or maybe there is, you know, and what should we do not to go there? I will, I will, <laughs> I will put it in this way. Terrific question. I mean, I, I hope, first of all, the war ends soon. And I hope that does not come, does not come to pass. I hope there's a thriving democratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, system and, and uh, afterwards. And I think there will be. Um, I think what this question points to is that common enemies can create cohesion, right? And so when in, in circumstances such as the one that Ukraine finds itself in, uh, there is a rally around common cause, around the government, around the president, around, uh, you know, kind of a cohesion and helping one another because that's a way of survival, um, and so, you know, I mean, it's interesting to look at Zelensky, right, whose popularity was uh, quite more heterogeneous prior to the war, right? but of course now is an incredible leader who stepped up and rose to the occasion. Um, and so you see that kind of phenomenon play out in, uh, even in, in some, you know, in other circumstances. So after 9-11, uh, 
Uh, there's research by Yuval Feinstein uh, and others showing that Americans rallied around the flag. They rallied around the government in time of crisis. Um, and that lasted for some time. But eventually, once the threat subsided, um, then things returned to some version of normality, which means people started disagreeing again about politics, about identity, about what America is and where, where it ought to go. Um, in some ways, that's just how things go, right? Like that's democratic politics is predicated on disagreement and that's fine. Um, so my sense is that once the war ends, you know, after a period of rebuilding and uh, Ukraine will come back to just a normal kind of democratic equilibrium where people will fight over politics and disagree about policy. That's what you want. Now, the question is, will radical right politics be part of that eco political ecosystem? That I can't tell you. Um, it depends. I mean, what happened after 9-11 in the U.S., interesting, again, I'm not comparing these situations because they're drastically different, but just in the sense of that there was initial rally around the flag, um, it actually radicalized a faction of the population, partly because there was an identification of the threat with Muslims from without, from outside, and um, and so there, among many Republicans, those tendencies, kind of kind of exclusionary tendencies, became heightened after that. Um, Democrats, on the other hand, of course, kind of went back to their kind of normal steady state and were egalitarian, et cetera, for most part. And so that created the seeds of subsequent rise of radical right and these deep disagreements about nationalism. Um, I think in Ukraine, you've got a different situation because it's a different kind of, you know, the enemy is quite different. Uh, or the you know in the U.S. it was a perceived enemy. In your case, it's a quite concrete enemy. Um, and so you know there may be radicalized radicalization, radical right politics of a certain kind at some point, but it's not as you know the path to it is not as clear to me as it, it was in some other cases. Um, I think much will depend also just on the decisions of political elites afterwards. Like what kind of a Ukraine will people want to come back to and imagine in the future? If it's an egalitarian, if it's in, an inclusive, if it's a kind of a, um, a pluralist Ukraine, which I think was most likely, then the path forward should be relatively smooth, right? And maybe at some point there'll be a backlash and maybe some radical right politician will rise up and we'll see how far they get, but chances are probably not very far. Um, but it, it you know, partly depends on, on all these kind of grie grievance producing changes, right? Which are structural and societal. And so it's a little hard to predict without knowing how those will look. Um, but I think I think for some time, at least the the kind of collective, um, you know, uh, coming together and collective effervescence coming out of this real horrible crisis will sustain Ukraine democratically for some time to come. At least that's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. Um, I also wanted to make it's rather a comment than a question, but I find it so um fascinating and interesting that you show these four types of nationalism and it really resonates to a public discussion which is very active now in Ukraine because people re-evaluate how they understand the concept of nationalism uh, especially now when you know uh, on the one hand people reflect to what they heard from Russian propaganda, you know, when someone calls you a Nazist or an extreme nationalist, naturally you want to reflect on that and to find arguments against it and to make sense of what is nationalism, what are they talking about. On the other hand, you know, there are people who actually rediscover uh, their place in a society and they want to understand how to interpret their feelings and their mm -hmm. mobilizations. They ask questions, so are we nationalists? So what does it mean to be nationalist? Right. And there are debates about around intellectuals, like how to identify what is happening in Ukraine. And I feel that when people have this high level academic or pundit level debate, sometimes they don't have language to describe yeah. what they want to describe. And your categorization, these four types of nationalism actually provide very interesting and useful language mm -hmm. to describe different types of people, how they feel about the nation. So again, not a question. Just no, I appreciate that. It, it's quite, I, I feel that it might resonate with a lot of people outside of academia because it actually makes a lot of sense, you know, to, to your real life experience, how you, how you live through this socialization mm -hmm. and your place in the nation. No, I appreciate that. And I mean, you know, in nationalism, especially in the Eastern European and Central European context is often used as a slur, right? Like, oh, you're a nationalist. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that yeah. typically means you're like you're a you're a chauvinist, ethno nationalist, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Populist. Um, but I, I think what I what I, the the intervention I'm trying to make is to say, look, the nation is a is a primary source of identification uh, in 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 the modern world, and what how we imagine that nation matters, but nationalism is sort of a given, like we're all nationalists in some way, mm -hmm. uh, especially when threatened, right? I mean, and all of a sudden that identity becomes really powerful and important. Um, what's interesting though is, you know, sort of linking what you just said to your previous question. Um, so there's evidence that a lot of separatist um, regions, nations, so whether it's Basque country or Catalonia or Scotland or, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, quite often when they're, when the, uh, nationalist sentiments are turned outward toward, you know, the, the 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 power you're resisting. So for Catalans, it's Madrid, right? For Scotland, it's London, and so forth. Um, what the result is that the internal nationalism gets quite inclusive and egalitarian. So a lot of these places are, you know, quite um, pro EU, quite pluralist societies, and their main grievance is with the other kind of center of power outside. And so again, not at all parallel to Ukraine because what Ukraine is is currently you know experiencing is so vastly uh, different and more complicated and more horrible. But but the but the point is that when when the lens is turned on a foreign aggressor or a foreign power that you're sort of acting against, it can lead to a lot of cohesion and it can also lead to a lot of pluralism internally. So that's certainly a possibility. Um, but you know, I, I guess I guess we'll see how that plays out. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I think I'll end there. I was tempted to say something about Poland, Polish nationalism, and the welcoming of Ukrainian refugees, but maybe that's a, that's a separate question. <laughs> well, we'll we'll have you more. We'll invite you more to discuss the separate questions. I think it's uh, you know we're right on time. Uh, I don't see any more questions, and I you know uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for the lecture. We will post it on YouTube a bit later. We will share it with you. And uh, yeah, I hope to meet you. I know that you often travel to Poland and to other European countries. So hopefully we, we can engage you when, you know, when it's going to be a bit more safer here in, in Kiev. I look forward to that. Thank you again for the invitation. And thank you to everyone who's come to uh, see the lecture and uh, I'll see you, uh, I'll see you hopefully soon. Yeah, take care.